This program is brought to you by Emory University. Um, first of all, I want to thank uh, Professor Feynman for inviting me to Emory. Uh, I'm here for the spring semester. Um, and thank you, the five of you, for coming, the six of you for coming, um, despite the weather. So I am going to talk about uh, my research, which is over the conflict of care choice systems in Swedish elder care, which I call a, a marketization of elder care. Um, and in general, a move to towards a more market-oriented welfare regime in, in Sweden or in Scandinavia. My starting point is the equality of the system. It might be said that these uh, changes is a chal challenge to the egalitarianism of the Scandinavian welfare model. And um, I want to know how this could be understood through ap applying a vulnerability perspective. So the purpose of my project is to examine the introduction of care choice systems in Swedish care for older people as part of a conflict over the future of uh, the welfare state. And the marketization of welfare is particularly visible in the um, elder care sector. And it's also quite possible to isolate that sector compared to changes in, for example, education, where uh, changes are uh, more complex. Uh, uh, so the elder care sector, as I see it, is therefore a good case to analyze um, or understand processes in uh, the welfare state on a bigger um, scale. But there are also reasons to uh, analyze the change or changes in elder care sector in itself, as this is a great and often overlooked part of the welfare system and will be of increasing importance following demographic changes in Scandinavia. Um, and the studies that exist on the effects of the introduction of care choice systems in the care for older people uh, point to increases in structural inequalities in elder care, which we will uh, get back to, um, due to the le legislation changes that are central to my research. So part of my research focus is to explain these increased inequalities in terms of changed ideals for and discourses surrounding the welfare state and how care choice systems tie in with previously established uh, egalitarian ideals. And my project also through a vulnerability analysis challenges underlying ideals and presumptions put forward in the care choice leg legis legislation and connects these with um, the inequalities that the marketization has led to. So to this end, my project examines and makes a discourse analysis of the legislative history of the law on the introduction of care choice systems in elder care and of legal regulation and documents on different levels of the system. And I also set this in relation to empirical knowledge about the effects of uh, care choice systems, secondhand material, and in light of critical theories dealing with welfare state issues. So in order for me to describe my project, I think I need to give you uh, a background uh, explaining principles of Swedish uh, welfare state and the developments it, it has been undergoing. And I will also explain a bit about how elder care and how care choice uh, systems are organized and work. Uh, but fo focus will be on the bigger, the broader picture. I will talk for about 40 minutes, I think, and then leave room for questions afterwards. But if, if there's something you don't uh, understand while I talk, please uh, feel free to ask me about it. Um, so let's start out with some important definitions that we will be going back to uh, and placing the well Swedish welfare state within. Um, first of all, privatisa privatization can um, take form, privatization of welfare state can take different forms. Uh, it is not always defined, but I wanted to avoid confusion and therefore uh, spell it out. So I see uh, the privatization processes in the welfare state of consisting of four different possible processes. The first being privatization of responsibility. Who is generally regarded uh, in law or legal practice defined as the principal responsible for a specific task, for example, 
taking care of elder peop older people in need. Uh, second being uh, privatization of uh, financing, which is of course connected to the first one, but not necessarily so. So this uh, refers to when the price for the needed service is paid for uh, instead of uh, by the state, uh, by the one in need or by another private entity. Uh, third is privatization of production, when responsibility and financing is still placed within the public sphere, but production, uh, the production itself, it moves to private entities. So from state or municipality owned services to private companies. And this is the kind of privatization that has, has most clearly occurred in Scandinavia, but there are also signs of the two uh, former kinds, um, which I will briefly get back to. And the fourth one um, is marketization, as I define as the processes and policies which convert areas of social life to markets and that transform objects or behaviors or institution to commodities that can be bought and sold. Uh, as well as a, it's also connected to a motivation for production from a non-commercial public ethic to profit maximization and market rationalities. And a neoliberal ideology views market forces as kind of an ethic in itself, uh, which can be used to govern almost every aspect of human activity. Uh, and if so, then competition is seen as a central value and where markets do not naturally emerge, government is expected to intervene to create them. Next uh, definition, I want to talk about welfare state universalism. And there are various definitions in the literature about <coughs> welfare state universalism, but I will stick to these uh, important keys. First one is equal access to services, regla regardless of who you are, what you own, how rich you are, and where you live uh, in the country. Uh, next one is equal treatment, non-discriminatory discriminatory practices. Third is equal quality. Uh, it, sh it should be equal regardless of where it is produced and by whom. For example, schools are supposed to be of the same quality, whether private or public, etc. Um, high quality is also an important part of welfare state universalism. It should be the le at the level where it's not attractive for most people of the middle class to turn to private alternatives instead. So this is an, um, important to keep, keep up support for the welfare state, um, which is of course then tax paid. So uh, it's related to that. Um, it's right based rather than based on voluntary commitments or charity or um, it's, um, yeah, th there are strong social rights uh, in, in the law or in re regulation. Um, and the last uh, aspect is the distributional principle. Um, it is not, as it often is in the States, for example, need. So it's not need te tested, but everyone um, is allowed um, to get this service regardless of, of your income, regardless of, or of if you have a high income or not. Uh, it's instead, it's based on either citizenship, but uh, nowadays more commonly residence because it's uh, all EU citizens, for example, is included. Um, okay, so that was the definitions. We'll now um, give you a short background to Swedish welfare state development and especially then elder care and also go into the organization of elder care and what voucher systems in elder care has meant, that's care choice systems. Um, and then we'll get back to the de definitions and see what has happened to Swedish welfare in, in terms of privatization and universalism. Um, so the 1950s to the 70s are usually called the strong decades of Swedish welfare project. There were funds and ambitions and it developed quickly. Um, 
The project started in 1930s, you could say, with uh, the Myrdals and the idea of the people's home. Um, but the post-war period was uh, the booming years for a Swedish welfare state. And the project's ideas rested on an uh, emancipatory ambition. Uh, the individual should be freed from dependency in relation to the labor market, which can be called the social uh, democratic project of decommodifying the workforce. But the welfare state also served to reduce dependency on the traditional family. It was also, at least from the 60s onward, a project to free women of their caring burden. So it was a feminist project. And the publicly financed and publicly produced care was a central part. So it was both financed and produced uh, publicly. Um, it was a central part of the so-called strong state, which bared responsibility for almost every aspect of its citizens, of the lives of its citizens when they couldn't um, um, bear it on their own. And during this time, the 50s to the 70s, the care for older people um, evolved from something that was a system of poor relief, you could say, uh, to a relatively extensive public care, um, organized according to principles of universalism. And at the same time, the liability of the family to care for older people was removed uh, in the law. And this shift in responsibilities from private to public then uh, led to a dramatic expansion in the magnitude of municipal care for older people. So it's placed in the mu uh, municipality and not in the state. Uh, during the 60s and 70s. In the late 1980s or beginning of 1990s, however, the development changed um, in the welfare state in general and in the elder care sector in particular. Um, a period of downsizing in the elder care began and that is a trend that has uh, continued since and also picked up during the last decade. Uh, for comparison, if you look at the proportion of population aged 80 or above, so the oldest, um, that received elder care to some extent, it was in 1990, uh, 53%, so more than half of the population. Uh, and in 2011, which is the last number that I have, it was 37%. So it, uh, that's quite a significant decrease which can only to a small part be explained by increasing health conditions and then there's uh, a smaller need for elder care. Um, in parallel to this downsizing, you can see that there has been organizational reforms from public to private production of elder care services and they have often been motivated by neoliberal ideal ideas about efficiency of the public sector. Reforms that we have seen uh, includes, uh, include competition incentives, performance-based allocation of services, resources within the public sector, um, as well as com um, increased competition with private companies. So the new public management trend, as it's called, has been significant in all of Scandinavia. And a part of this has been the development of voucher systems and so-called so -called freedom of choice reforms. Uh, and here is where care choice systems come in. Um, so the care choice system in the elder care allo allows the care recipients to choose from those providers that are registered in, in the specific municipality. And then the municipality pays for the care. Uh, so the relationship goes between uh, the older person and the municipality and between municipality and uh, the private company, not directly between uh, the care uh, recipient and, and the company. So, and the municipality still decides on uh, which service that is going to be provided. So the choice is really not over the type of service or how it should be done, but just over which uh, entity that should produce it. 
And more than half of Swedish municipalities have a care choice system in action today in the home care services, if you uh, spell it down to that part of the elder, um, elder care. Um, and that is following a legal act of 2009 uh, that also had incentive resources from the right-wing government who wanted to, um, uh, yeah, that were driving behind this reform. And the other half of the municipalities either has only in-house production, so still public uh, production, but more commonly they have private production, but outsourced only to one instead of uh, a number of uh, private entities. Um, so th there, there were customer choice systems in no some municipalities around before this law, but a very small number. But so there has been a significant shift towards this kind of organization following this 2009 law. So it's a, uh, a recent uh, development. In the preparatory works uh, of the law, you could see particularly three types of arguments for why this um, reform is uh, wished for. And the first is that choice is presumed as something being intrinsically good, which means handing over power to the care uh, recipient. Um, second is that the service, they think that the service market needs to develop. Um, they believe it's job creating and it gives care workers the possibility to own, be the owner of their own companies. That only happens to a very small degree, I should say. It's mostly um, big companies owning. Uh, these services. The third argument is that this will lead to an increased quality of the elder care. And this third argument rests on economic theories about markets. So if, if we create a, a quasi market like this, it's quasi because price is fixed, um, where care recipients can leave bad providers for better ones, then bad providers will go out of business and quality will increase. That's the idea. Um, another reform that has been made in parallel with this, uh, which I will only touch on briefly, even if there's a lot of to say about it, is it's a tax reduction for in-home services of any kind, like cleaning or care or other services. And the reduction is positively connected to income, meaning the more you earn, uh, the more you can buy services at a reduced rate. So it's basically the state subsidizing middle and upper class for buying uh, in-home services. And in one of the main sectors it has been used is in elder care for people um, with higher incomes to top up services that are given by the municipality. So uh, if we should sum up this uh, brief description of the elder care, uh, according to the de definitions that we started out with. If we um, look at the privatization of responsibility, we can see that that has partly happened. The downsizing of elder care has meant increasing responsibilities for the individuals and for relatives. Um, so now about 5% of Swedish workforce uh, claim that they have had to cut down on work or stop working entirely to take care of an older um, relative, and it's of course highly gendered who um, chooses to do so or is uh, more or less forced to do so. Uh, when it comes to privatization of uh, financing, it has also been partly, and the tax reduction that I mentioned is where you can most clearly see this. People who can afford now buy elder care services on the free market with this tax reduction. Uh, to either supplement or entirely replace the public services given by the municipality. If you look at privatization of production, here is, as I said before, th where you can see the, the biggest difference. Uh, few municipalities uh, um, today have only in-house production of services. Um, and the elder care sector is a booming industry in sw Sweden, since there is no restriction on the profit that you can make and price is fixed. So it's one of the uh, best uh, industries, service industries to go into. Um, 
uh, and marketization. Um, yeah, the the care the point of the care choice system is of course to uh, introduce a market rationale uh, in a se sector that did not at all have that before. So the care recipients are no, now more um, often called customers, and they're expected to shop on a market with their voucher for the highest quality care. Um, so let's look at the definition of universalism and compare. I, I have chosen 1990 just as to have a reference point. Uh, when it comes to equal access to services, um, it of course uh, had its problems already then. The ambition was that it was going to be equal access, but of course structural inequalities existed uh, uh, then too. But these problems have gotten bigger, which we will see um, soon. Equal treatment um, is the same. Now, when it comes to uh, equal quality, uh, that is the whole point of care choice systems, right? That uh, there are better and worse providers and that you should choose the better ones. So that is, uh, per definition, um, a no. Right-based, it's still right-based, but it's harder to get. It's not as generous, the system. And the distributional principle, you could say, the same. It's still residents, and uh, that is the the distribution principle. But it's also harder to get it. But it's still not um, the economic need that is defining if if you're getting it or not. You are as entitled as a millionaire as the one who cleans for the millionaire. Um, so we can see that although Swedish elder care was never perfectly universal, it was closer to than it is today. And al although there is still a basic universalism in the system, it is not as strong as it used to be. Uh, and this, of course, is connected to uh, the different kind of privatizations that, that we um, just saw. And this change or this shift um, is it's described differently in Swedish discourses or narratives. Was it either the result of a legitimate critique of a paternalistic, ineffective and bureaucratic welfare state? Or was it rather a result of a neoliberal development of society with greater, lee greater leeway for capitalism and less for politics and democracy? So you could see that there are two, two different stories of uh, why we have had this development. But what recurs in the descriptions uh, regardless of their different views on cause and effect, is that there has been a change in the discourse held by central community stakeholders with freedom of choice, individualism and decentralization as keywords related to a change in governing towards competition, privatization and marketization in its different forms. Um, so now let's uh, focus um, in on the care choice system, uh, understood then uh, against this context. And let's uh, look at which effects that can be seen in re research done on the care choice systems. Basically, what happens with the introduction of choice. Um, first, it should be clear that still, since th this happened in 2009, we still haven't very much research um, so we also have to look at research from other comparable uh, areas. Issues that have been discussed in the literature are the older user users' actual ability to make good choices. Critics points point to the risk that choice system will lead to resourceful individuals getting a more qualitative care than those who are not able to or to the same extent active in choosing. And that this will lead to that already underprivileged uh, groups getting relatively worse off with increased unequal distribution as a result. So the research shows that resourceful individuals benefit from uh, a choice situations, situations si since they tend to find information easier and demand more. And people with lower education or 
who does not speak Swedish natively, which is a growing uh, group in Sweden, or have disabilities of physical or cognitive kind, which is of course common in uh, the whole age group, they are likely to be disadvantaged, having then more difficulties in making an informed choice or requiring improvements in their care. Um, comparable empirical evidence from the health sector shows that patients' choice of healthcare providers are governed by social class in the sense that individuals with a higher level of education are more commonly making active choices than those with lower. And there are also studies that indicate that social groups relate differently to information and knowledge about quality in the care situation. Furthermore, although discrimination in the social services is prohibited, there is still a risk of so-called reverse selection, what's also called cream skimming, by the providers, which may prefer to focus on selected and less costly target groups. It might rightly be, cla be claimed that it's paternalistic, paternalistic to argue that some people are not as good in making active choices than others. But I think that at the same time, research shows that how unequally distributed social and cultural resources, as well as other structural and institutional factors, largely determine people's life conditions. And so also in this area. Um, I will make uh, one short note on the question of, of quality, um, if, uh, if that's also a, a big issue, as this is the, a main motivation for the introduction of care uh, choice system. A noticeable fact about the choice systems is that only about one in five um, of those who live in a municipality with care choice systems in uh, action actually make an active choice. So that's not very many and only one in 20 s switches then at a later stage. So that's even fewer. And most of the ones that switches does so because of um, the provider has gone out of business. Uh, this could of course be explained by that every provider is a good one, uh, but it can also be explained by the above. A lot of people find it hard to make such a choice in their life situation, so they go with the municipality's no choice alternative and trust this to be good enough. The no choice alternative can be the municipality itself, but it can also be a chosen private provider, or some municipalities even have a different kind, uh, different kinds of lottery systems in action. It's not sure that the age group needing home health services is the ideal type of customer. Furthermore, and maybe even more importantly, uh, care services is not the perfect commodity because the number one quality indicator of care services is continuity. So if you want a qualitative care uh, to switch and to shop around is directly against the, your interest. Uh, and this meaning two premises of the ideal market situation as la laid out by economic theory are not present here. And then we cannot expect to get the desired result, higher quality either. Um, especially since choice is the primary mechanism of ensuring quality, because monitoring systems, are, they are in place, but they are underfinanced or working poorly. Instead, the risk is that providers can hold the quality just above the I really need to switch level which can, for a lot of people, be very low. So the quality can also be then very low. And those pe people who hold the quality, um, uh, who does not expect too much, um, are more likely to be belong to groups that are less likely to switch with, we s s just saw was people with lower education, lower income, disability, or without supporting relatives. So they will, to a higher degree, be stuck with lower quality service providers on a general level. And due to cream skimming effects, more resource demanding groups might also pool up with certain providers, lowering the quality level since the voucher system is not flexible to how much resources you actually need in a complex care situation. 
Um, so how can we understand all of this? Um, yeah, uh, if we see here a conflict between an egalitarian ideal of Swedish welfare and that the care choice systems in fact seem to be a risk to equality in the system. And this conflict is generally not brought up in the discourse surrounding care choice system. The discourse, uh, the problems that are discussed are much more of the character. How can we make the competition work better? How can we make the market perform better? So it's focused on, on um, that aspect. Um, so I have found in particular three things in Professor Feynman's work that can help us understand the situation we have at hand in terms of uh, what the conflict is about um, through, then through a vulnerability lens. Um, the first is that choice is made in an embedded situation. Professor Feynman talked about our resilience, which assets that we have at hand when we go through life's ups and downs. According to what we have talked about before, uh, it is evident that the possibilities to make active choices for care providers are dependent on the assets um, which we have at hand. Could be education, the Swedish language, functionality or ab abilities, uh, relatives that are um, involved. And if the informal barriers are significantly, significantly higher for some users than for others, the access to choice can then not be considered equal. A choice is also made within a social context by us as embedded creatures. So choices of welfare services are not only de determined by market forces or by rational choice, but also by institutional and other social conditions. And the promotion of values such as freedom of choice, therefore risk enhancing the benefits for already resourceful citizens who can use their economic, institutional, social, cultural, bodily or other assets to ensure that they get most, uh, uh, the most possible out of the welfare state. Um, the second point is um, the citizenship idea uh, behind this reform uh, and it's it's based, as I see it, on an autonomous subject. So um, if we look at how our govern governing ideal is based on an autonomous self-preserving subject as opposed to an embedded or embodied vulnerable subject, when analyzing the discourse uh, of the freedom of choice reforms, it becomes clear that they rest on the former image rather than on the latter, right? So the care choice systems presumes a citizenship with a so-called active dimension, which means a responsibility for uh, the citizens' own well-being. Um, individuals should protect themselves against risks by exercising choice in relation to the market. And the market is central to this idea and represents a place where the individual can act independently, freely, according to his or own, her own interest. And this will indirectly then lead to the outcome that is best uh, for everybody, Pareto optimality. Um, and this is the uh, autonomous individuals who has the right to make choices, the right to contract, but no strong social rights that respond to our vulnerability or, or dependency. Um, and as Professor Feynman shows, and as is also evident in what we have learned about different social groups, their ability to make choices, the general description of the autonomous subject fits better to certain privileged positions than to others. The relationships that we are in or that we create, whether they are social, economical or on a family level, do not operate according to the ideal of the free market and the contract situation in which we are all assumed to have the same bargaining power. Rather, the idealization of the contract and of individual choices hides structural inequalities that exist on a societal level and thus assist in consolidating them. Um, 
And the critique of the autonomous subject uh, as an ideal is also connected to our third point, um, an analysis of the construction of the dividing line between public and private. So a legal regulation that assumes an anti-interventionist policy will ignore the unequal patterns that characterize the intimate sphere and then regard human vulnerability and dependency as something that should be handled privately or in the family. And this discourse also breeds images of independence, self-sufficiency and agency and it explains individual failures as weaknesses or inabilities since the division between public and private means that they will be regarded not as a responsibility of society but as belonging to a different sphere. Um, so if we look at care choice systems, the quality of care is assumed to be largely an individual responsibility through the individual choice of leaving a bad provider for a better one. And this notion of the care recipient as an active rational customer distorts the reality of the care situation and move this problem then to a private sphere uh, where potential inequalities in relation to choices are made invisible. And this is rationalized by a discourse justifying and normalizing market entry in all aspects of social life based on a description of reality bound by certain economic laws of nature. Okay. Um, to sum up, uh, as I stated in the beginning, I see it that there is a conflict over the future of the Scandinavian welfare state, which can be seen then in the d discourses surrounding it. Um, and the idea behind the welfare state, as it used to be, is threatened uh, by conflict in ideals that spawn from neoliberalism. And care choice systems in elder care are a distinct point where these conflicts can be seen or become clear. And these are the main discursive clashes that I, at least at this point, can see between the two systems of thoughts or mentalities of government or how you um, choose to name them. Mm. So first of all, equality versus freedom of choice. Uh, so we can see that a care choice system seems to lead to a higher in inequality in outcomes uh, several factors indicating that it may, may mean an increased factual in the inequality um, among elder care recipients. And the care rationality of the elder care has meant before that inequalities has been seen as unjustifiable. However, care choice systems rotate the system toward a market uh, or customer rationality in which inequalities become easier to accept. Uh, differences is almost part of the system or the idea. Uh, and freedom of choice and equality is therefore values that in many ways act as opposite and they are in turn connected with other dichotomies. Selectivism instead of universalism, regulation based on the individual rather than on the collective, private rather than public responsibility for care, and individual explanatory models rather than structural explanatory models. So I see the care choice systems as a slides, slide towards the latter stages in these dualisms. Furthermore, the weakened universalism in the perceived distribution of high quality care uh, might mean that the middle class instead, instead demands or prefers freedom of choice and a model in which the public care for older people can be, su be supplemented and improved by privately financed care and then of course lower tax um, as the other part of that. Um, a regulation that opens and to some extent encourages the existence of possibilities to top up the publicly financed care which uh, in itself uh, is downsized that constitutes a clear step away from universalism as a principle for Swedish care for older people. Uh, and some scholars argue that the d diversification of welfare services is to an increasing extent, ex increasing extent desired by uh, the welfare citizens, especially the middle class. So the universal solidarity 
uh, thought has in that case lost ground to ideas about individualization and freedom of choice. Um, citizens and, and customers uh, is a clear, also clear uh, conflict. How should we formulate what you are as a care recipient in the system? Um, the individual choice of a care provider within the care choice system is driven by other mechanisms than the political choice of how care should be organized and distributed. So in the former, we act as customers. We think of our own uh, individual good or personal utility maximization. And in the latter, the, the political focus of how care should be organized we act as citizens on basis of solidarity or the common good. And this will in turn mean that criticism of the content or quality of care, if we move uh, towards a market rationality, it will be looked upon as customer complaints rather than as political criticism, uh, and then have different ways of solving the problem. So by systematically degrading the public realm, and the political influence on people's social conditions, M welfare marketization cha changes the basis of citizenship from a social and universal to a uh, contractual conditional. Uh, and choice reforms uh, in the care for older people can be understood as an expression of privatization discourses that reformulate care needs from a public to a private problem, um, as we talked about. Uh, and this uh, helps in turn to decontextualize care and conceal conditions and effects that are linked to structural inequalities. Um, so to sum this all up, one of the initial ideas behind publicly financed universal welfare was to protect citizens against market forces with the aim, aim to increase social equality. Uh, however, these values then seem to be weaker in current social policy and instead values of consumer sovereign sovereignty, individual rights, economic efficiency and private initiatives are at the forefront. And the individual responsibility in the development of welfare services can be described as maybe a political capitulation to the market. Welfare policy was once seen as a solution to the social problems that were created by the market. Now, in turn, the market is to solve the problems of the welfare state. So the rationality has turned. Um, and in a neoliberal driven new public management development of public services in Scandinavian countries with voucher system and changes in the formulation of public commitment and public expectations, the relationship between the public and the citizens come to rely more on citizens being increasingly expected to be active, promote their own interest. So this is the de development that we can see. But on the other hand, it's not natural, it's not driven by uh, natural forces, and uh, we'll see where uh, it ends up. Since it's September, we have uh, a new social democratic government which has announced changes in welfare state re regulation, but it, it's yet to be seen which direction their reforms will take and what we it will mean for elder care sector. Thank you. <laughs> it was incredibly interesting and well done. Why why the elderly are, are the first? I mean, why are, are they the first group that gets picked on, do you think? Um, are they, I mean, are mm. in this country, the elderly are very politically powerful, so they tend to be protected from these kinds of mm. things. But they are not in the Swedish system. Uh, it's, um, I think it's a combination of, of different aspects. One being there are no or very few uh, lobby groups for elderly. The ones that exi exist are for mostly for younger elderly, and they talk a lot about pensions mm -hmm. and those kind of things, um, pen pension age. But elder care comes in at, at a later stage in life, later stage in life, where it's maybe harder to voice your opinion. Also, the if you look at the generations that are, has undergone this process, 
those are generations that uh, was brought up in a time where you should not be too demanding, you should know your place. <coughs> there, um, they have a, a large degree, a large sense of uh, like not of the collective. Fate. <laughs> Sorry? Fate. Fate. Y yeah, um, but also. I'm a little person, I shouldn't say anything to the system, that kind of attitude. Um. So, but it, I mean, it's interesting to think about how this works next to all the problems in Sweden around immigration, right? Um, and so how, how that, because I imagine that the immigrant population is not elderly, right? They are. Oh, they, they are. are. Yeah. Okay. Um, there are, both that we have had immigration for quite some time, so that we have people who have been become uh -huh. uh, old in Sweden, but we also have older immigrants, um, and you can see um, that they are uh, clearly discriminated against in the system um, uh, on different levels. They're, it's harder to get service. Um, their relatives are supposed to. The, you talk about a cultures of families, so they don't get. Uh, access to public care because they're their relatives are supposed to take care of them and so so it's all all those kind of um, of problems but also immigration is um, a large part of the workforce in elder care are people who have immigrated because we have a very yeah. uh, racialized uh, work job uh, labor market where uh, underpaid jobs mostly go to uh, immigrants, and this is a, a low-paid job. Um, I want also to suggest there was one other thing that was privatized, so in your definitions of privatization, and that is the, um, the quality, con uh, quality control mechanisms. So it's the, c it's the consumer right now who monitors whether the quality is there or not. It's not the state that becomes responsible for ensuring the quality. Well, it's, it's both and because... At this point, but it's, you're moving the same way you're mo making the incremental moves and the other, otherwise, because it was the state's responsibility before. Yeah, but, now but, but according to regulation, mm -hmm. it is still the state's re or the municipality's right. responsibility. But that comes in conflict with what uh, this law says, because it says that one of the points of it is to increase in quality right. through um, people moving right. on the market, right? Yeah. Uh, and you can also see that in when you look at the um, the municipalities, the monitoring system, they are not very developed. Right. So, um, so the actual responsibility then falls right. uh, more and more on the individual. It's, in, it's both it pri it's privatized in that it's individualized and it's no longer, or the state is no longer functioning in, in that way effectively. Yeah, right. Do you and also, I ask a question? No, You're that's right. what we're here for. Um, I wonder about, um, about Sweden's history, uh, at least in my understanding of, of US history includes the notion that if you went to the public house, that was shame. You know, you yeah, were, stigmatization. There, there was yeah. a real stigma, and that if you, you know, in the 20s and 30s, if you took government handout, you were taking charity, and that was something that I just wondered about the dynamic then of the move in the 70s to o overcome that. Was there the, a similar kind of a cultural view that if you if you submitted yourself to the public, you would really be bringing shame both to yourself and to your family. And was that something that there was real buy-in for? No, you know, that's not the case, but we're all vulnerable and we're all going to submit at some time to need elder care and therefore it's going to be provided by the state. How, how did that mm. dialogue take place? Well, it, I, I would explain it very much through the social democratic project uh -huh. that the, the discourse of welfare uh, was that this is based on universal solidarity, yeah. this, is, uh, this is for the common good. So it, 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 that took away of a lot of the stigma. Uh -huh. And also that it was made in such a quality 
the, the quality was so high, so it wasn't a stigma to receive it because it wasn't, it wasn't bad. Um, so uh, that people from all classes used the system. And for, for example, in terms of measuring the quality during that period of time, um, it, would it be, and I'm always confused about quality because did you get your, since your own room, um, you had, you had uh, a, a place where you could potentially uh, cook your own meals, um, you could have some independent, independence in your living, was that part of the quality of it or was the elder care kind of staged depending upon your, your health? So you started with kind of a unassisted living to assisted living to a kind of a hospitalization um, and that each one of those things was monitored. How, how did you know at that in, the, in those populations of 80 yeah. to 85 years, mm. how was the quality measured that it was really good and it wasn't just yeah. being put into a room with a group of other people and being treated in a kind of an institutionalized way? Yeah, th that was yeah. how the um, elder care looked up until the 60s or uh -huh. so. Uh, it was very much an institution. Right. Um, but that changed. Uh, I would say also that if you measure quality, it's always dependent on uh, the level of expectations, of course. But if you see that the the attitude or the um, the sense of quality, uh, if you ask um, care recipients, uh, it was high and it, it's been continually high, but but falling. Um, the system used to rely mostly on. Uh, elder care homes, but where you had your own room or small apartment within the home. And those still exist, but they are, a lot of them are, has disappeared and they, instead you're supposed to live in your own home. Assisted living is, I right. guess, what that's called. A home care, that's what I call home right. care. Right. Um, because that's much cheaper for the municipality. Right. Much, much less hours of work. Right. So that is, of course, also a lower quality. It's, it's always described as a high quality. You get to stay in your own place. But a lot of people, the, the, the queues or the people wishing to move into a home is very high. So it's not that people prefer to stay in their own homes. But, this is, but it's rationalized through a discourse of home being the best place to be. Even if it's very lonely and you only get, you, the only people you will, you will ever see is home care service coming three times a day. Huh? Yeah, thanks, uh, Miriam. Uh, it's very interesting, uh, your presentation. My question is that regarding this shift of paradigm in the elder care system, um, you have mentioned that in both, in both uh, systems, they, they are right-based ones. Um, and of course, uh, this, the social welfare state or, or the idea that you can go to the public to receive some sort of assistance, I, I think that if it is right-based, you, you don't have the, the problem of uh, feeling that it's charity. That's like the whole issue of being social rights and based on solidarity. So it's very interesting that you are going through a, like a de-evolution because in the evolution of liberal rights, you understand like, uh, that first we have civil rights and tolerance, then we gain political rights, participation, and afterwards you, you get to social rights mm. in solidarity. And it seems that we, uh, that you are changing, uh, like getting away from solidarity to like, so my, my question is, there has been a change in theoretically in, in how you understand rights and um, and also if, because I don't know like the constitutional structure of your juridical, of your legal system, so have there been a change in constitutional rights? Do you have a sort of social rights recognized that have changed? Uh, yeah, it's a very interesting and good question. The fact is that if you look at different social rights, uh, there's, they're not really in the constitutions, but in, in different care laws. And if you look at uh, social rights for disabled, for example, they have been strengthened. Um, now, it's one thing what the law says and then how, it, how the practice works. 
And I think that for the last years, uh, the care for disabled has also been weakened, but the, the social right for care for uh, disabled people are much stronger than if you compare that to the social right for um, older people. Uh, that social right uh, is defined as uh, an acceptable standard of living or a good standard of living even, but it's not defined what that is. So it's, 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 it's weak in the way that it's very weakly defined, which, I mean, the point of a right is that you should be able to take it to court and get it. But it's, if it's not defined what it's going to, uh, what the content of it is, it's hard to do that. Mm -hmm. So it's, there, there are very little court cases because there's no point in bringing it to the court. So, and, uh, but that has not changed. I mean, it's been the same since 1980 when the Social Services Act, which regulates elder care, uh, uh, was introduced. It's been exactly the same uh, sentence, but the content of it has widely changed. And I think that that fact is very uh, interesting. Yes. Of course, I should also say that we have um, a legal system that uh, relies on law and regulation much more than on court cases. So um, it, it really matters what it says in the law. But and uh, not when it's defined in this very uh, weak way. Yeah, and, and I, I forgot to say before, I really think your paper is really, really interesting and very well done and organized. And so I'm, I'm struggling a lot because of a personal story. I wonder, you, you, you framed a lot of the story you told about how much of the care initially fell to the spouse, to the, to the wife, uh, who often outlives the husband and therefore has a lot of the obligations initially to take care of it. And so I'm hearing your story through an experience with my, mm -hmm. with, I just lost my father this year, I uh, lost my father, uh, and my mother had real difficult time with the decision to have him go into the hospital as opposed to staying in the home. Yeah. Um, and so when I hear your story, I think about how for her, her identity, mm -hmm. it was so important that she continue to care for, um, for my dad. That yeah. it was her responsibility to continue to care for. And until she was told by some of the hospital caregivers that you have done everything that you can do. Now go back and be a wife and it's time for us to take over and take care. She wasn't willing to do it. So the trade on the, on the care of my father versus her own individual sense of responsibility mm. for me. Well, if it was uh, it was a balancing act between those two, and what would be good maybe for my dad would not necessarily be good for my mother. And maybe with a warped understand, maybe with a warped understanding of her own responsibility to take care of. Mm. And and I guess what I'm what I'm wrestling with is the dichotomy is between a private decision as if it's just an individual, mm. as opposed to the government decision. And and what at least I experienced is that it was complicated by mm. also my mother's decision, which yeah. was also wrapped up in her own identity. And so it's just not just one no. you know, or the other, but it also what play does the family get? What play does the kind of community or the culture get and how they define themselves in in making some of those decisions about what care is best for um, a particularly elderly person. Does that yeah, make sense? Absolutely. Um, and uh, this problem is also recognized in the literature. And I think that well, part of it depends on how you view uh, the public care system. I mean, it's easier to leave the responsibility if you know that uh, right. you hand it over to someone who's doing a good job. Doing right. A good job. Yeah. Um, but also, if you look at, um, if you ask the older persons in need, uh, do you prefer uh, a relative taking care of you or prefer the public taking care of you? In Sweden, 9 out of 10 say the public. Um, so it's a, a very strong, like, a very strong trust in the system. And also, it also says something about how we view relatives in Sweden. You're not supposed to have a care uh, relationship. 
Mm. Like that that's not the kind of relationship that you're, but you're that's, having. That's true here too. When mm. you when you look at the ch uh, uh, parents not wanting mm. to have their children assume responsibility mm. for them. Yeah. I think mm. it's very different when you're talking about spouses mm. perhaps. Yes. Right. But <clears throat> but when it but it's the same thing here when you when parents are asked do they want their children to care for them the answer is no overwhelmingly no. Yeah. They don't want to mm. burden their children that way. But I think that with your in the situation in the United States too the whole structure is such that your mother, it is her responsibility, right. but that responsibility placed on her doesn't look out for her welfare. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, because she's also an older person. Right. And so why right. she should have that responsibility. Right. And if you wanted to intervene, right. you can't. The legal structure doesn't allow it to be right. a family right. decision. decision. That's right. mm -hmm. You know, she, because of her relationship, she has the priority. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, there's a, a lot of, yeah, a lot Sorry. of things going That's into right. that. But you, the, the, Professor Feynman is absolutely right that there is also, a, you could see a, a difference in spouses caring and in uh, children caring. And, and a, a, a very significant thing there is that it's much more gender equal when it's spouses caring than when it's children's, children caring. Correct. Right, so, um, and you, it has, the, the difference is not at all as big either. Um, like the shift has not been as big on that level right. where spouses has continually cared or been part of the care at least but what what has really what is really new is that so so many children has to uh, work part-time or not at all to take mm -hmm. care of their parents or step uh, parents um, so that is really like uh, the bigger shift than Spouses I, don't know what, I don't know what play to give this, but you know, the unintended consequences of having my brothers and sisters have to weigh in on that, on that whole care mm. was to bring some more meaningful relationships between us as, our, as, as children of my father in that process. Yeah. There's a kind of a, I don't know how you measure that, but right, while it seems like it's such a burden when a person makes a decision to go back and take care of an elderly parent, but there's also sometimes there's a good that's in there, mm -hmm. and you know whether whether it's forced on you um, or whether or not you discover your and, and you know your common vulnerability that you're going to have to go through this also at some point in your own uh, your own aging process, and, and also then you reconnect in some ways, meaningful ways, saying thank you. Um, uh, remembering together uh, those kinds of events, the notion that the family has a play in there and has some responsibilities in there to kind of cut that off as a matter mm -hmm. of a legal right. I worry about the unintended consequences of yeah. that. You know, I think you could probably measure that, but I wonder if you need to take a rights-based approach to that. But but I, I'd say divides people as opposed to bring them yeah. together. So we, we yeah. have never had a system where relatives has not cared. <laughs> Okay. Um, relatives have, have always been a part of the picture. Right. Uh, otherwise, I mean, that would be probably the, the largest sec right. sector in Sweden because right. it's such an, uh, a big job taking right. care of it, an older population. And I, I don't think that there is anyone suggesting that we should not have relatives caring at all. Uh, but re research um, indicates that, so it's, whether or not it's a positive experience for relatives caring it depends on what kind of care uh, they have to take. The more intimate it is, right. uh, the harder it gets, right? right? So it's, it's much easier to go shopping than right. to change diapers, right. for example. Mm -hmm. And the other is, is there an alternative right. and, or a compliment or uh, right. someone taking the bigger burden? Right. then it's much easier to be involved. And, and are they supported in their take caretaking? I yeah, mean, are they subsidized? Because I, they, back to your definitions of privatization, so privatization of responsibility, responsibility should be shared between the family and the state. Mm -hmm. Privatization of financing, the state should assume some responsibility for financing. So that when, you know, so that you, you have to look at that too, because care does not occur without resources being supplied. And in our system, these resources come from the individual and the family, mm -hmm. not from the state. Yeah, but you can also see that, that if you look at relatives caring, we had a system in place where you could get hi be hired. Yes. 
by the municipality right. to do that care, which is exactly right. that support, right? right. Uh, but that is almost abolished. Now the only ones that get hired today, they are um, immigrants' children, uh, because you don't have the cultural, religious, or language competence in the municipality. But it, it's also very problematic because um, the ones that get hired, they are persons that, women who are very far from the labor market, and they, they get more they get more stigmatized or um, like it's harder for them to be out than in the public because of that system, right? So it's it's not that's not only a positive system, but you could see that support system has like on a general level really been um, taken away uh, for family carers. Well, thank you again. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you for coming.